The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. I'm Wes, and that's my wife and co-host, Beth. Welcome, everyone. So, just a bit of quick housekeeping before we get into tonight's stories. If you haven't already, please leave a rating and comment for us on your favorite listening platform. Your ratings and comments go a long way in helping us to be more visible to people looking for something new to listen to. And if you have the time while perusing Facebook, check out our page and click that follow button. Yeah, and if you wouldn't mind, tell your friends and family. They might be interested in listening to us, too. And if you're in the need of some new summer t-shirts, you can always check out our store on TeePublic. Wes spent a lot of time designing a bunch of different designs, so everyone has something to choose from. Yeah, it was It was a lot of fun, I gotta admit. I did have a good time doing that. And last but not least, if you'd like to support our show in another way, you could always check out our premium bonus episodes. They're just $3 an episode, and we strive to bring you really interesting topics that aren't always related to the supernatural. Although sometimes they are. Yeah, so go ahead and check one out if you haven't before. You may like what you hear. Well... I see your story tonight is about a place that we're hoping to visit this Halloween. It is. So there are many buildings in Salem, Massachusetts, that claim to be haunted, from museums to hotels to liquor stores. But the Joshua Ward House has racked up quite a few mentions on the most haunted lists. CBS News named it one of the six most haunted houses in the entire U.S. in 2013. The New York Post named it one of the 13 scariest haunted houses in the U.S. in 2015. And the Boston's Ghosts website listed it as number four on the top 20 of most haunted places, just one spot above the Lizzie Borden house, just to name a few. So what exactly is causing the Joshua Ward house to land on all these lists? Well, melted wax apparently shows up in rooms where there are no candles. People have reported seeing the apparitions of at least three separate ghosts, and one of them, nicknamed the Strangler, tends to make people feel as if they're being, well, strangled. Add the sensation of feeling scratched or burned, and you can see why the house has the reputation it does. But why the Joshua Ward house specifically? I mean, I would assume there's some negative residual energy all over Salem, to be honest. Most people say it's because Sheriff George Corwin, the man responsible for torturing the accused witches of Salem, once lived there. But to really figure it out, we have to do some fact versus myth separating. There's no argument whatsoever that Corwin was not a nice guy. He did some pretty horrendous things to people. But historians point out that it's really unlikely that he did any of it inside his own home. And that's where the urban legends come in. Several sites about the Joshua Ward house list all of the atrocities that supposedly happened in the house, but there just isn't any proof that any of it was carried out there. So the existing Joshua Ward House on Washington Street in Salem wasn't built until the latter half of the 1700s, but when it was constructed, it was placed right on the foundation of George Corwin's former home. At the age of 25, George Corwin was appointed the High Sheriff during the Salem Witchcraft Trials in 1692. His uncle, coincidentally, or not, some people shout nepotism, 
was Judge Jonathan Corwin, who sentenced 19 of the almost 200 accused people to death. There are a lot of myths told about George Corwin. One popular myth is that he brought accused people to his home and tortured them there. One alleged way he did this was to take them down into his basement and tie their necks to their ankles with a rope until their noses bled profusely. It was this torture method that earned him the nickname The Strangler. I also came across a reference to his house being used as a sort of apartment building for accused witches. But according to the Joshua Ward House page on the official Salem Witch Museum website, neither of those things are substantiated by any written evidence. However, I will point out that based on what we learned about the Hartford, Connecticut witch trials, not everything was written down. What we do know as documented fact is that one of Sheriff Corwin's jobs was to confiscate material belongings from the condemned men and widows. Things like livestock, their crops, and household goods like kettles or furniture or jewelry. According to the law at the time, if a married woman was put to death, all of her material possessions went to her husband. So that's why stuff was only taken from condemned men and widows. The stuff Corwin confiscated was supposed to be inventoried and then stored away, to be used as payment towards the cost of keeping them in jail and to help support any surviving family members. But Sheriff Corwin didn't exactly follow the rules, especially when it came to John Proctor. John Proctor's wife, Elizabeth, was accused of witchcraft, and John spoke out against the ridiculousness of spectral evidence. That's when people claimed that someone's spirit did evil things to them, either in dreams or in spectral visitations. When he defended his wife, townsfolk turned on him, accusing him of being in cahoots with her and the devil. Even before John and Elizabeth Proctor were hanged, Sheriff Corwin seized all of their belongings, including their livestock and all of the beer at a tavern that they owned. Sheriff Corwin apparently slaughtered a bunch of Proctor's livestock and shipped it off to the West Indies for a profit. After John and Elizabeth Proctor were hanged, their children were left with absolutely nothing. So they definitely didn't get any financial support from any of the items Corwin confiscated like they were supposed to. Another of Sheriff Corwin's jobs was to escort the condemned prisoners in an ox cart to Proctor's Ledge on Gallows Hill, the designated execution site. Although hanging was the usual mode of execution, that wasn't the case for Giles Corey. Corey didn't comply with the expected court procedures, so he was sentenced to death by pressing. Sheriff Corwin watched as planks were laid over Corey's naked body as he lay down on his back on the ground. Then, stones were placed on the planks. And as more and more were added, Corey basically was crushed to death. However, it took two whole days. As Corey's tongue rolled out of his mouth, Sheriff Corwin reportedly pushed it back into his mouth with the end of his walking stick. Giles Corey was 73 years old, by the way. At this point, we're going to briefly wander back into legend territory. Another myth for years is that Giles Corey's last words were a curse against Sheriff Corwin and the entire town of Salem. He allegedly cried, quote, Damn you, I curse you and Salem. But the Joshua Ward House webpage points out that there is no documented evidence that he ever said that. What is documented, according to the Beehive website, which is run by the Massachusetts Historical Society, is that Giles Corey remained silent through his two-day torture, up until the very last time Sheriff Corwin asked him how he pled. Refusing to plead guilty, his last words were, quote, more weight. After Corey's death, 
Sheriff Corwin extorted money from Corey's daughter. So not exactly an upstanding, scrupulous man. No, he was a piece of work. He was. Philip and Mary English were accused in April of 1692. They managed to flee from Salem, but when Philip returned after all the ridiculous hysteria ended, he was enraged to discover that Sheriff Corwin had confiscated countless assets from his home, warehouses, wharves, and shops anyway. Before English could be compensated, Sheriff Corwin died of a heart attack in 1696. Now, this is true. Corwin was so hated, so completely detested, especially due to his treatment of Giles Corey, that his family feared that his body would be dug up and desecrated. Another popular myth is that Philip English threatened to do such a thing himself. I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that Corwin was hated enough that it could have been a real fear. But again, according to the Joshua Ward House official page, Sheriff Corwin's family did not bury him in the basement of his own house for safekeeping like the legends say they did. He was actually buried in a cemetery. After Sheriff Corwin's death, the property changed hands several times until businessman Joshua Ward purchased the Corwin house. Ward was a major supplier of molasses, which was used in rum production and various spices, so he was a pretty prosperous sea merchant. He demolished the house itself in 1784 and hired architect Samuel Luscombe Jr. to build the three-story red brick federal-style home that still exists today right on top of the Corwin Houses Foundation. The bricks of the Joshua Ward house were set in a Flemish bond pattern, which I had to look up. It means that they alternate the bricks so that one brick has the long side showing and the next one has its short end showing. The home has four chimneys and 12 fireplaces. In October of 1789, Brand new President George Washington was so impressed by the quality of the home that he requested to stay there while he addressed his troops. Since 2016, the Joshua Ward House has been called The Merchant, and it's a boutique luxury hotel. Curiously, since it became The Merchant, there have been no reports of any hauntings. But prior to that, there were quite a few ghost stories swirling around about the place, which makes me wonder if the merchant is just trying to keep it hush, hush, because they are a luxury boutique hotel. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Several people, both visitors and employees, have reported feeling very uneasy while on the second floor of the house. Some have even had the unnerving feeling of being watched, and there are are a few who have had a worse sensation than that. There are a handful of reports of people that claim they felt as though hands were around their neck, and then they felt pressure as though they were being choked. It happened so often that this alleged entity became known as the Strangler, and many people believe that it's obviously Sheriff George Corwin. Now, the Joshua Ward House page doesn't say that Sheriff Corwin didn't use strangulation as a torture device. It just says that there's no documentation that he used it inside his former house. But visitors, including paranormal investigators, have also had run-ins with Sheriff Corwin in the basement, or who they think is Sheriff Corwin. There was one account where an investigator was in the basement alone, setting up equipment, and when he didn't meet back up with his group, they went to look for him. They found him on the basement floor, gasping for breath. He said he felt as if something had pushed him from behind and then wrapped its hands around his neck. He allegedly had the bruises to prove it. Another member of the same group caught an EVP that said, quote, I just want to keep you. It's so creepy. <laughs> it really is. 
Visitors have also come out of the house with unexplained scratches and burning sensations on their skin, which may be the sheriff's doing. I mean, it does make sense that he would still be there. Although the majority of people who have felt this strangling sensation have been men, which is kind of odd since we tend to think of the Salem witches as mostly female. He did arrest over 150 people, including men, women, and children. One little girl was as young as four years old. We've heard it plenty of times. If you were an evil person when you were alive, you're probably an evil-ass ghost. The second spirit said to haunt the Joshua Ward house is Giles Corey, which is interesting. If both the sheriff and Corey are sharing the same space in the afterlife. We've seen cases on TV where two spirits are in the same physical space, but they don't seem to know that each other is there. It's almost as if they're on two different planes of existence within our own plane of existence. And I don't know if that's the case here, but it's interesting to me. The activity attributed to the entity that they believe is Giles Corey is things like cold pockets of air in an otherwise warm room, books that fall off of shelves for unknown reasons, pictures that topple from shelves, and that melted wax thing I mentioned at the top of my story. There are several mentions of melted wax being found in odd places inside the house, sometimes when there isn't even a candle anywhere nearby. But even if there is a candle, it doesn't appear to have ever been lit. The wax just melts on its own, and it frequently melts into the nearest surface in the shape of an S, which many people believe is Corey's way of indicating that the sheriff, or the strangler, is nearby. I'm not exactly sure how people are connecting Giles Corey specifically to this entity. I couldn't find any more detailed accounts that made me go, oh yeah, it's definitely him. But regardless, there's something going on there. Lastly, there is the entity known as the Witch of the Joshua Ward House, which I find kind of ironic, since none of the people who were accused or executed were actual witches. You would think they'd call her the lady of the house or the woman, but they don't. According to multiple websites, in the 1980s, the Joshua Ward House was used by the Carlson Realty Company as their office. Supposedly, the employees dealt with lights shutting off and turning back on, doors shutting on their own, and burglar alarms being triggered for no known reason. They began talking about a female entity that they had even caught glimpses of up on the third floor. In 1981, the company held their Christmas party, and one of the employees snapped a bunch of pictures with his Kodak Polaroid instant camera. One picture was just of his blonde co-worker standing in front of some decorations. But when the photo developed, she wasn't in it. Instead, there was the blurry figure of a curly, dark-haired woman, her hair all tangled and wild. She was dressed all in black. Apparently, this photo was featured on several TV news programs across the country after it was published in the Ghostly Haunts comic book. It was such a huge story that it even ran on international news stations. Now, I have to be honest, I looked for it online because I like to have all angles of a story and corroborate things and have multiple sources. And although multiple sources said it happened, when I looked for old news coverage. I looked for newspapers, um, TV account, uh, news reports. I looked for the photo itself. I tried all different keywords. And I did find the same blurry black and white picture three or four times of a curly, dark-haired woman in a black dress. She's standing in front of a wooden door, but the photo is so cropped that it's impossible to tell where it was taken or why it's in black and white. And when I would click on it and go to the sites, there was no photo attribution or captions to explain if that was really the photo from 1981. 
So my spidey sense told me that it wasn't the actual 1981 photograph. So to me, I had to deem it inconclusive. So I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying I'm not a good enough internet sleuth to track it down, apparently. And yet, the Joshua Ward house is, or was, since the merchant house says it's not haunted anymore, since 2016. (laughs) It is, or was, considered one of the most haunted houses in the United States. So there had to be a reason especially since Salem offers up so many possible contenders. So, to end my story, I went back to the George Corwin Joshua Ward House page on the official Salem Witch Museum website. Now, keep in mind, this website isn't directly affiliated with the hotel that currently runs in the house. It's a site dedicated to the history of Salem. I thought I'd leave you with this little tidbit from their webpage. Quote, there are numerous myths around George Corwin, including the idea that he tortured prisoners in his basement and that he or his victims haunt the site to this day. There is no evidence to substantiate the claim that Corwin was torturing prisoners, nor that this was taking place within his own home. However, today popular tradition maintains that the Joshua Ward House is the most haunted house in Salem. End quote. So they're saying they don't think the torture happened, but they're not coming out and saying it's not haunted. It's interesting. That it is. So maybe we can go there if we go there in Well, we will go there if we go there in October. I'm all in. <laughs> oh, well, it's a hotel now. We'll stare at it through the windows. <laughs> Well, perhaps we'll stay there a night. A boutique luxury hotel? Sure. Why not? Are we boutique and luxury? Mm, Not really. (laughs) We're more like campfire and (laughs) s'mores. (laughs) I can play the part for a night. Hey, did you know... It's no secret that Benjamin Franklin invented the lightning rod and bifocals, but we also have him to thank for inventing the following stuff. The flexible urinary catheter, which he created for his brother-in-law. The unspillable soup bowl to make ship travel more comfortable. The grabber claw, because he was tired of ladders. The electrostatic machine, because he was just cool like that. And swim fins, which attached to his wrists and made them hurt. To thunk it. So what are you talking about tonight? Well, you know that I love researching old folklore. I find it interesting reading and hearing about the tales that have been passed down throughout history. Now, some seem a little outlandish and hard to believe, but I think there's always some truth hidden in them. And that's what makes it so much fun trying to figure out bits of truth from fiction. And I believe that's what drives people to go out there and look for the unknown, hoping to maybe get some answers. And even if you don't find what you're looking for, the journey is always an adventure worth taking. So sit back, get comfy, and let's take a little trip to Arkansas. When people in Arkansas opened up the January 31st, 1897 edition of the Arkansas Gazette newspaper, they were shocked and frightened by what they read. The culprit behind all the recent livestock murders in the northern part of the state had been solved. It was a 20-foot-long, green-skinned monster. Of course it was. The monster had both tusk and sharp claws and a row of horns all the way down its back, ending with a blade-like point at its tail. The creature had emerged from a lake and taken on an entire posse of men, even gravely wounding a man before the monster finally succumbed to its wounds. In its lair, the shaken men found skulls of all kinds, including humans. The article was even accompanied by a frightening illustration based on a photograph. 
The creature was clearly some sort of wingless dragon that fed on livestock in the dead of night and hid in the darkness of caves during the day. The dragon would even attack and kill humans if given the chance. And just like that, the legend of the terrible green Gaurau was born. Now, according to the fantastical article written by Albert Smithy, he had a pretty credible source. It was a man named William Miller, who was a businessman and went on to be the Arkansas State Auditor and 12th Governor of the state. Or, then again, it could have just been a traveling salesman who coincidentally had the same name. It's not entirely clear. Allegedly, this William Miller was traveling through the Ozarks when he arrived in the town of Blanco. Residents recounted telling stories of hearing a terrible cry in the night from some unknown creature, a sort of gawawro sound. Then their livestock were being killed. Miller was staying with a farm family one night when their son burst into the house, saying he had seen strange tracks in the snow while he was out rabbit hunting. The tracks were huge and unlike anything he had ever seen before. Miller wasted no time forming a posse, and the armed men went out in search of this beast, carrying burning pine knots for light. After tracking it for several miles to a river, they spotted a cave with such a smooth opening, they agreed it had to have been worn away by a huge creature going in and out over a long period of time. As the posse stepped into the cave, they were met with this awful sight of numerous skulls staring back at them, including deer, sheep, goats, and cows. But it wasn't just livestock. There were human skulls in the cave, too. Unnerved, they ran back outside. Suddenly, a terrifying green creature emerged from the river just beside them. It walked close to the ground on short, thick legs, ending in webbed feet like a duck. Duck feet with claws, that is. It sounds like... It sounds like the Volpertinger or the, the jackalope. It's like a mishmash of different animals. Yeah, kind of like a platypus. Oh, yeah. As it walked, the ground shook. Pointy scales lined its entire back, and its long tail ended with a blade-like point or sickle. But what's even more odd is that its face looked almost human-like, but had tusk curling up over its bottom lip. That's no platypus. Miller, unlike most modern-day people who spot something unusual, actually took a photograph with his Kodak camera, allegedly. And then he ordered the posse to fire. Despite numerous direct hits, the Gowrow thrashed in pain, taking down a tree and maiming one of the posse. As Miller put it, the creature, quote, died hard. <laughs> Do you think Bruce Willis came... Running in, crying, yippee ki -yay. <laughs> Isn't that from Die Hard? Yeah, that it was. <laughs> Although Miller expressed regret over having killed the only known Gaurau to exist, he said in an article that he had shipped its remains to the Smithsonian Institute to be studied in catalog. Except, as luck would have it, the package never made it to the museum. Of course not. Fred Alsop, who was the Arkansas Gazette's longtime business manager and accountant, publicly dismissed there being any truth to Smithy's article, saying, quote, It was a great fake, probably without foundation in fact. End quote. I should also point out that I couldn't find any specific information on Elbert Smithy, the author of the article, but James Newton Smithy the owner and major stockholder in the newspaper at the time, had a son named Elbert. Interesting. Nepotism again, perhaps. Readers of the Arkansas Gazette, especially the people living in Boone County, believed the story. I mean, why wouldn't they? It was in the newspaper, and it was an explanation as to what had been killing their livestock. Although there were no other sightings and the Gowrow was dead, his story didn't end there. Vance Randolph was a beloved Ozark folklore researcher and collector. He began writing for various journal publications 
while still in high school, and he graduated from Clark University with a psychology degree in 1915. He moved to the Ozarks in 1920 and began collecting everything he could find on Ozark legends and folklore, including music. He focused on Ozark dialects, first publishing a ton of articles and books. But his books on folklore became the standard for how to conduct folklore studies. Randolph found what he thought were accounts of Gowrow sightings prior to the 1897 article. In fact, he said that accounts went back at least a decade to the 1880s. His sources claim that the Gowrow of Smithy's article wasn't just a one-off, that there were actually an entire species of these creatures, according to folklore. They hatched from soft-shelled eggs the size of beer kegs, and female gowraos carried the newly hatched baby gowraos around in pouches like possums do. They hatched from eggs that were the size of beer kegs? Yeah, that's a huge egg. That is a huge baby to then be carrying around in your little pouch. Well, it had to be a big pouch. <laughs> it had to be a really big pouch. <laughs> well, let's not be judgmental. <laughs> He included a sighting from the tiny town of Self, Arkansas, in a cave known as Devil's Hole. Now, Self, Arkansas is a real place in Boone County, but when I tried to find a cave known as Devil's Hole, I couldn't find anything on it. I did find a Devil's Den and a Devil's Icebox in the Devil's Den State Park in West Fork, Arkansas. But the park is in Washington County, not Boone County. And today, the two counties don't border each other. So I'm not saying there isn't a devil's cave in or near the town of Self, but if there is, I wasn't able to find it. Anyway, the encounter in 1880s at Devil's Cave goes something like this. One day, the landowner decided to explore the cave on his property. He tied a rope and descended 200 feet down into relative darkness until his feet touched some sort of rock ledge. The cave shaft narrowed so drastically beneath him that he would have to crawl through. But before he could even come to the decision on if he really wanted to take that chance, a loud hissing, like that of a giant lizard, echoed off the walls. The man ascended back to the surface as quickly as he could. He returned later with a group of men for backup, and they tied a flat iron to the end of the rope. They lowered it down and were met with the sound of that horrible lizard-like hissing. Only this time, something also attacked the rope, pulling it taut in their hands. When they managed to bring it back up, the flat iron was completely bent and covered in deep scratches that they could only assume were teeth and claw marks. Undeterred, the men tied a large stone to the end of the rope and lowered it down. This time, whatever was down there attacked the stone, pulling the rope super tight. When the men managed to pull it up from the creature's grip, the end of the rope was completely empty. Randolph also discussed a Gowrow sighting in the town of Mina in Polk County, which was also in northern Arkansas. A resident who was either incredibly brave or incredibly resourceful, managed to catch a gowrow by feeding it huge amounts of dried apples. The story goes that the gowrow's stomach ballooned from eating so many dried apples that it couldn't move very fast, and the man was able to capture it. Wanting to show off his catch, the man strung up a curtain and told curious townsfolk that they could see the creature for just 25 cents. After collecting money from a decent-sized crowd, the man would then go behind the curtain, tussle with the gowrow, who must have recovered from its overly full stomach, and emerge with his clothes in complete tatters. The man would then inform the frightened crowd that the gowrow has escaped. The scared crowd would quickly disperse, minus their money. How very, very clever. <laughs> I wonder how many times he got away with that. Like... Did he call out, don't worry, I'll catch the wily beast again, come back tomorrow. <laughs> well, I can't imagine how he would explain it, 
but I imagine it was quite entertaining. Especially if he was in that town, how many times could he actually get away with this? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Although the only documented sightings occurred in the late 1800s, there was allegedly more in the 1950s. But I searched for quite a while, and I couldn't find any information. So that begs the question, was the Gaurau just a legend? Was it created by Albert Smithy? and then retold so many times that it entered local folklore? Or did William Miller really exist and truly see something that is actually misidentified? Was the terrible green gaurau just a common animal, like the razorback pig? They certainly fit part of the description. According to the online Encyclopedia of Arkansas, the most common color of feral hogs is black, not green, of course. They do have tusk and bristly hair, which could give them the impression that the creature had spikes. They can also grow to be pretty big, with the males averaging to be about four to five feet long and weighing anywhere between 150 and 300 pounds. They do wallow in the mud, which could account for the green color Miller said he saw as the creature came out of the river. It's well known that razorback pigs do attack and kill small livestock like lambs, goats, and calves. Plus, they can run up to 35 miles per hour, and it's rare for them to attack humans unless they're cornered or protecting their babies. So, did he just see a razorback pig and then create a monster story to go with it? Or is it like I suggested? Did Albert Smithy just make up the whole thing? Nobody really knows for sure, but the legend of the terrible green gaurau of Arkansas has certainly stood the test of time, as far as folklore goes. It's mentioned in countless magazine articles and online articles, including tons of fan fiction, like trading cards and art, etc. Also, one last little tidbit. The title of Vance Randolph's book of folklore in which he discussed the gaurau, it's titled we Always Lie to Strangers, Tall Tales of the Ozarks. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> we always lie to strangers. I love that. <laughs> that is a great title. So, as far-fetched as this story seems, there are parts of this story that could quite possibly be true. Now, to me, there is all kinds of reasons why the men might have thought they saw a monster. Was it really mistaken for a razorback pig? Or perhaps they made it up for a good reason. Maybe they thought they could put the people's minds at ease by saying they had killed it. Or perhaps they really did kill a creature, and it was the last of its kind. Now, I gotta say, I don't think we'll really ever know the truth. But the truth is out there somewhere, lost to time, and regardless, it's an interesting story that kind of gets your imagination flowing. It does. It's quite fantastical. But every time you'd say it, I just wanted to look at you, gaze lovingly into your eyes, and go, gow row. <laughs> wow. Well, maybe if I pull on your tail, maybe <laughs> kick you in it, you'll go gow row. Wow. Kicking and pulling. That's not very nice. It's hot in here. Are you grumpy because it's so hot in here? It is a little warm. Ooh. All right, fellow wanderers, I think that about wraps it up for this episode. I think so. And if you'd like to know more about the Joshua Ward House or the Gao Rao, you can always check out our sources in our show notes. Yeah, join us next week for all new episode of Where Minds Wander. See you soon.